All right, hello class, and welcome back to lecture eight, part B. So in the first part of this lecture, uh, we talked about how to take a control problem, one sort of formulated in terms of block diagrams, uh, whatever that block diagram structure had to be, happened to be, maybe it's from um, Simulink or uh, some uh, very complicated analysis of what the system is and what all its inputs and outputs are, and very complicated wiring diagram, whatever it happens to be, P1, P2, P3. So a very complex system, maybe we have some interconnection like that. And of course, in undergraduate controls, we learned how to find the transfer function from inputs to outputs, for example. So if we have the input here, output here. Uh, we learned how to find that transfer function in undergraduate controls. Uh, in this case, of course, we're doing something similar, but not quite. Um, of course, we can think of all these p's as transfer functions, but we tried to get away from that thought to some extent and, uh, and identify which are our uh, control inputs and which are our disturbances. Uh, in which are our regulated outputs, in which are our sensed outputs. Maybe got some uh, other W over here. And the goal was not necessarily to reduce this to a big transfer function, although in, a, in the end that's sort of what you do, but rather to put it in a particular form of transfer functions, sort of this two four system representation of your uh, complicated block wiring diagram. So we call this a four system representation. Right. Because there are four subsystems, right? P1, P2, P121, and P22. Right? And they map these differentiated set of inputs to the differentiated set of outputs. So once you have this structure, once you've put your problem in this structure, it's in this sort of standardized optimal control framework. We also talked a little bit about the nine matrix representation of the same block, right? So there's two ways of thinking about this block here. So this is the nine matrix representation. And that's a state space representation, right? Because you've got a, a, an internal variable there, and then your uh, signal's going here, and there's x and w and u. Right. So two different alternative representations of the same structure. And of course, k is our variable. And really, which one you choose informs how you view the optimal control problem. Because remember, the optimal control problem is minimize the map from disturbances to uh, regulated outputs where you're optimizing over the controller. And of course, this map is, has some, is a function of your system and your controller. Right. So which one you choose. And again, it was, uh, we, I think we, we made a case that it was relatively easier to formulate the system using the four system representation than the nine matrix representation. Although we, I did give you hints on how to, to do that nine matrix representation. So which one you choose really depends, is going to affect which one, uh, which, what your choice of variables are. So in particular, say we chose the four system representation. And really this, uh, I want to diverge a little bit, this four system representation, uh, we can think about these as systems, but we can also think about them as transfer functions too. Right? Because the transfer function, as a multiplier at least, uh, acts in a similar way in the frequency domain as the system does in the time domain. It forms an algebra, it has all the same nice properties, so it's easy to formulate this four system or four transfer function representation, if you prefer. Uh, then it is to formulate the nine matrix representation because it, it was a little bit more work, right? We had to uh, pull out that X dot, and uh, so there was a little bit more effort involved. 
Which one you choose, however, and we'll see this going forward, depends on, is going to affect what you view as your uh, variable in the optimization problem. So if we think of these as systems or transfer functions, then our controller k, which is our variable, right? That's the variable, right? Uh, will typically often also be thought of as a system. Switch it back to pink. Uh, so we'll have this, uh, this system k and maybe h infinity as, as our variable. Or, right, if we think of it on transfer functions, it'll be transfer function as our variable. Right? Alternatively, if we're in the state space formulation, we'll think of the four state space matrices which define a system as our variables. Right? Uh, so AK, BK, CK, and DK. And of course, we're a little bit more used to thinking of variables as matrices and variables as systems or transfer functions because we really don't know how to parameterize transfer functions quite as much. But that view is not uh, it has not always been the case. So it tends to be if you grew up learning this stuff in the, uh, in the 80s, for example, you would be inclined to think of this k as a transfer function. You'd use like Euler parameterization to find uh, the, uh, the, the variable transfer functions, the, to parameterize the set of access, uh, h infinity transfer functions. Whereas there was a slight, there was a growing shift in, in the 90s and, and of course nowadays uh, certainly it's dominant to think of this control variable as the four uh, matrices which define a state space representation. Neither of them is entirely invalid, but of course with LMIs and the advent of LMIs, we have more tools that work directly with matrix representations than we do with um, transfer function representations. They're, they're, both, uh, they're both equally valid. And I'll talk a little bit about, in this lecture, but then we'll drop it, this, uh, this transfer function representation. So, okay, let's like, uh, with that perspective in mind, let's then go on and figure out and focus on uh, how we formulate this objective function. So we have the sort of standardized representation. So this is the rep. And we want to find what is this map from inputs to outputs, from disturbances to regulated outputs, once we've closed the loop. So we're going to be closing the loop. So again, here we are in the system representation. And because the system representation is, is algebraic and it's quite easy to work with, in a way, it's, uh, it's a little bit easier to, to deal with these systems in, in this representation. You can all, again, you can think about these as transfer functions. There's almost interchangeably people use transfer functions and system representations. So going back and forth between signals and frequency domain. <coughs> right. And so the advantage, of course, right, of, this, uh, of this representation is you can write this system as a series of equations. In fact, there's only three of them. Right. Uh, so these, this is uh, the four, syst four system representation, where we have uh, two outputs and two inputs, the inputs being uh, W and U, and the outputs being Z and Y. So we have two equations for that. Um, and then we have one more equation, which is that feedback interconnection, which relates this input to this output. So there's a map between Y through a system K, not a matrix, a system, and uh, the input u. And so our only goal then is to plug in u equals ky and see what we get out of this. Solve the set of equations for z as a function of w. Right? So we want to isolate uh, the z and w variables, eliminating y and u in the process. So of course, the first step right, is to, uh, is to take this uh, expression for u and plug in now our expression for y. So we have now u equals a function of y and a function of u, right? So we're just plugging this equation into this equation, right? Well, this is a, that's, that's great where we could maybe eliminate u, uh, u here, except for the fact, of course, that u appears on both sides of this equation. 
Uh, the obvious uh, solution then is to take this term and group our u's together. So we get uh, 1i, which is the identity, minus kp22 here. And then, of course, we want to solve for u. And so the, the obvious uh, thing to do then is to invert this matrix and move it to the other side. And now we have an expression for u uh, directly in terms of the variable w. And now, so the only thing remaining is to plug this expression for u back into the expression for z, and we get an expression for z in terms of w, having eliminated the intermediate variables y and u. And so that's what we get here. Right? We just plug p11, goes right here, and this expression p12, right, comes in right here, and our expression for u comes in right here. Right? So this is, a, this is an expression, an algebraic expression, for uh, the output as a function of the input. So the, disturb, so the regulated output as a function of the disturbance input, having eliminated the control variable, uh, which now appears internally in this, uh, what's called the linear fractional transformation. So this is called the LFT, linear fractional transformation. Also uh, the lower fractional transformation because the controller appears below the, uh, uh, the, the plant, right? We'll mention that again in a second. So lower. So this, uh, this closed loop system, right? So we have now have an expression for this closed loop system. Again, if these are transfer functions, uh, then we can actually algebraically calculate this by inverting the, this matrix transfer function. Um, if they're systems, well, we don't know exactly what this looks like, and we'll come back to that later. But in any case, this lower linear fractional transformation um, represents the map then from disturbance input to uh, regulated output. Um, it has its own little terminology. So we've got uh, your S lower bar, right? So we'll use this quite a bit in place of that sort of awkward way we were formulating the problem. Um, and uh, it has another name. Uh, besides linear fractional transformation, the lower star product. And that's to differentiate it from the alternative case, which is the upper star product, where the controller appears above and feeds back that way. Right. So, okay. This is, a, this is so, somewhat important, right, uh, because Occasionally, we have two things which are connected in feedback. Uh, in particular, as we get after lecture 11, we're going to talk about robustness. And in that case, robustness, the uncertainty matrix, uncertain parameters, uh, all, are also have a feedback loop uh, associated with them. In any case, uh, for right now, however, we uh, mostly work with this lower star product. And so that's, uh, that's what we're going to be using for the most part going forward. Now again, this is represented in the uh, system level representation or the transfer function representation, whichever you prefer. Now, uh, we do also mention, however, this upper linear fractional transformation. And we don't use the variable k here, we use q because uh, the upper fractional transformation, upper LFT, is usually associated with uncertainties. Uh, so the, how uncertainties enter the feedback loop. But we'll talk about that again in starting with lecture 12. Um, so you can see that the, uh, the form is slightly different for the upper star product. It has a, a slightly different notation. Notice the bar on the upper side uh, versus the bar on the lower side of the S. So S standing for star, and the bar for upper or the bar for lower. And the difference, of course, being that uh, the numbers, right? This is P11, this is P22, right? We just, uh, we get different assignments. This is P11 versus P22. And of course, we swap the, uh, the orders here, All right? So it's just, uh, it's not particularly more complicated than the lower or upper, whether you're working in the lower or the upper, it's just a bookkeeping uh, mechanism. Uh, that said, we can, uh, we can form this sort of general star product, the, uh, uh, which encapsulates both 
uh, which is uh, sort of uh, maybe going a little bit overboard, but, but there it is. Um, so if we have uncertainties in uh, disturbances in both our controller or and our plant, and we have regulated outputs for the upper and the, the lower part, Right, and you can see that depending on which inputs and outputs you choose, W1, W2 versus map to Z1 and Z2, uh, you just pick out which of these systems uh, you need. Right, so here's the upper star product, here's the lower star product, those are the ones we you normally use, and here we have cross star products as well, but again, we're not going to pay too much attention to that at this point. Just be aware that these are both special cases of the more general star product, which we give here. And it's star because, I don't know, because there's like, like this, there's sort of a star in the middle. So that's the etymology of the name. Right, so now we've defined this map from inputs to outputs, right? So we can formulate our optimal control problem, K. And we'll do this more explicitly in a next slide. So lower star product of P and K, probably in the H infinity or H2 metric. Uh, but of course, we're in that case treat we in that case treated the variable K as a transfer function or a system. And there are certain disadvantages to that. Uh, so one of the disadvantages that we have is that uh, there are certain questions about, for a given choice of k, whether the system even makes sense or not. Um, and for that, actually, it's a little bit easier to work in the state space, the nine matrix representation, than it is to work with these star products, which are a bit abstract, and it's hard to quantify whether these systems actually have solutions and are proper. Right? So, in this case, uh, we are, uh, we, we're going to go back and uh, use the nine matrix representation, right? So P is now A, uh, B1, B2, right? For this is, uh, this is a disturbance, this is the input. C1, C2 for the regulated output and the sensed output, and then the D matrices just populate down here. So uh, then we interconnect that with our controller, and our controller uh, also has a uh, state space representation. Right, I'll put you to x dot here, uh, which is of course a k, b k, c k, and d k. Right, and that also corresponds to a state space where we have a new state variable which we're going to call x k, which is x dot k is equal to a k x k plus b k. Uh, y, because that's the input to the right to the controller, and then the output of the controller is u. Oops, that's my bad u. Which is c k times x plus d k times y. Right. So we uh, we can again formulate this feedback interconnection, close the loop in the same way we did for systems uh, for uh, the state space representation as well. Uh, this has a little bit more, a little bit, this is a little bit easier to interpret uh, because, of course, we know various things about state space. For example, we know that if a state space representation exists for this system, uh, there's a solution for the, the system for any given input, uh, disturbance input W. Right? So that's, that's a little bit uh, more helpful than we had in the general system representation. And in particular, in all of these optimal control frameworks, sort of a basic assumption that we make uh, when formulating these problems is well-posedness, that there exist solutions to these systems. Now, we don't know the case, whether solutions exist in general for the system level representation, but we have a pretty good idea uh, when solutions exist, and we can quantify it very efficiently for the state-space representation. So in particular for state space, we know that the system is well posed if these uh, system interconnection uh, re equations have a solution, right? So these are the, uh, this is the nine matrix representation of P, and this is the four matrix representation of K. Right? 
And so the question then is this coupled system, because we have a little bit of a problem here, right? We have to eliminate this U again and the Y again. Uh, and so here's a, these two equations, right? We have to eliminate these variables uh, in order to get a, uh, a normal looking state space representation in closed loop. And so it's not entirely obvious that this is a state space representation at this point. So let's see. Uh, yes. Notice that uh, there are various, uh, I, I, one thing I didn't mention, uh, there are, again, several ways of handling the system level representation, uh, and in particular for well posedness, uh, one of which is the use of extended L2 spaces. Uh, so, for example, passivity results, assume well-posedness. Uh, IQC, integral quadratic constraints, where generalizations of passivity uh, also require existence of solutions. So e the, the results we had earlier still require existence of solutions. It's just it's a little bit harder to prove in those cases. Uh, so we tend to work with these extended L2 spaces. But we're not going to, again, go through that in this, in this lecture. So now we're going to look at the... Uh, the, uh, the state space and try and determine conditions under which the closed loop state space representation exists. So it says closed loop state space representation of the system exist. Well, okay, you could ask why wouldn't it exist? Well, because we haven't formulated one yet. Okay, so let's do our best to formulate it. So first of all, we'll deal with the state equations. So that's taking on the previous slide, those two uh, equations for the state of the, of the plant and the state of the controller, and just writing them out. All right, x dot equals ax plus bu plus b1w, and then the controller x dot k equals akxk plus bky, uh, y of course being the output from the, uh, uh, from the plant, and then it doesn't affect, is not affected directly by w. Uh, then we've got this, uh, the output we're trying to locate, right? This is what we're trying to isolate. And the expression for that was C1x plus D11, D12u plus D11w. And of course, we also have an expression for uh, y and uh, u. Uh, u is dky plus ckxk, right? Just from the state space representation of the controller. And y is uh, d22u plus c2x plus d21w. And that's just from the, uh, the, the, the state space representation of the plant. Right. So I've organized this in a special way because I'm trying to isolate these variables which we'd like to eliminate. So we want to eliminate specifically the variables u and w, uh, sorry, u and y, right? Okay. These internal variables. So we want to map from w to z. So in order to get that, we have to eliminate these variables u and, du u and y, which don't, aren't supposed to appear. So we've written down our expressions for u and y in this form, and we can uh, go a little bit further, right? We can write them as uh, 0, negative dk, or no, plus dk, d22, 0, uh, uy, right? So just write that equation. And then plus a 0, ck, c2, 0, x, xk, and then plus 0, d21, w, right? So now, of course, we have u and y appear on both sides. And so the first step we have is to move this expression over to the other side, uh, which and group it with the identity matrix. So we get this matrix here. So now we have an expression for u and w as a function of x and w. Wait, u and y as a function of x and w. Except, of course, for the fact that we have this matrix in front of u and y. However, if we can invert this matrix, we can get an expression for u and y in terms of x and w, and thereby eliminate the 
uh, expression for u in y in the state space representation, and we'll get a nice clean state space representation in terms of x and w. Uh, and so what it comes down to then, really, in the state space representation, uh, well posed in this, comes down to the question of whether this matrix is invertible, right? Which isn't actually that bad a question, right? Because it not only involves two matrices, dk and d22. And so it seems like we should be able to get some relatively reasonably tractable conditions under which this system is invertible, or this, uh, the state space representation exists. And so in the, the question then we would like to answer in this slide is whether this matrix is invertible or under what conditions. Now, fortunately, it's a two by two matrix. And so we have a closed form expression for the inverse. Uh, specifically, we went through that in, uh, I think it was, uh, I forget, a previous lecture. Uh, I forget which one it is. Ooh, I think it was lecture six. But, uh, or maybe it was, yeah, I think it was, it was lecture six, I think. Anyway, uh, so we had a, a closed form expression, matrix inversion lemma uh, for this inverse. And it's given in terms of, well, this is it, which depends on this variable Q. So everything else in this matrix inverse is, is normal looking, right? So we can formulate it. So if this matrix inverse exists, then we're all, we're all good. And so the only thing that we really need for this inverse to exist is this expression to exist, the simpler expression. So we need I minus D22 DK inverse to exist. So the question is, when does this uh, exist? Can we simplify it even more? And unfortunately, the answer is no. We're sort of, this is as, as good as it gets. Um, of course, we know what D22 is a priori. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know what dk is because that's a variable. So, of course, one thing we could do is we could, uh, we could restrict ourselves to systems where d22 is 0, right? So if d22 is 0, we're done. Uh, unfortunately, uh, if d22 is not 0, so d22, what does that correspond to? Remember, if we go back to our uh, two input, two out rep representation of the nominal plant, right? Uh, D22 is the direct feed through term for how U affects Y, right? So that's going to, that's D22. And U can affect Y, that's not a problem. But the question is, is there sort of a static term for Y of T equals d22 u of t, right? That's sort of what it comes down to. Is there some uh, static function of the input which affects the output, the sensed outputs? Now this doesn't happen very often, right? When would it, why would your actuator uh, directly offense, affect your sensor measurement? Well, it could be, uh, it can happen, right? So for example, on an aircraft wing, if we have an aileron right here, and our actuator is here, and our sensor is located on the aileron, for example. Right? And so if our, uh, if by moving the actuator, we, there's an IMU on the, on, on the, the end of the aileron, uh, that's going to create a direct feed through term from the actuator to the sensor. And so that would cause issues, right? That, in that case, you have to be careful uh, about your DK, right? And there's no uh, easy way to implement this constraint that the I minus DK D22 is invertible. Uh, the only ways you can do it are A, designing your, your, your system so that your sensors are not located at the same place as your actuators. And generally, that's a good idea. You don't want to be picking up actuation uh, on your sensors. Or uh, you can solve the optimal control problem, hope for the best, and then check it afterwards. Right. 
So I don't want to minimize, right, the, this well posedness. It's very important. Uh, and in particular, it tells you something about designing your control system. In particular, you do, if you end up with a D22, which is not zero, really that's going to be a bad design of your, of your plant. Not the controller, but because we haven't designed the controller, but it's going to be a bad design of your plant if D22, because that's a function of, this, of the plant, is not equal to zero. Right. So now, you know, it's, see, this seems maybe like pretty hard to enforce, but of course, compared to the system or transfer function representation, at least we know what we're looking for and we can have some insight into it. Whereas for the, the, the system level or transfer function level, it's really hard to get a grip on uh, when we have well posedness and when we don't. So if that inverse exists, then we can now uh, formulate our state-based representation of the closed-loop system, uh, where here's our, uh, our, our state dynamics, right? They only depend on our W and our state. Uh, and we got that D inverse matrix here. And D inverse is also here, but it enters through Q. I've just simplified it a little bit. And our output then, a regulated output, uh, is also a function of the state, right? So this is our, uh, in our closed loop, right? We have our ACL, BCL, CCL, DCL, closed loop map from W to Z. And, uh, right, this is CCL, this is DCL, this is BCL, and this is ACL. So we've solved for a state space map from W to Z, which we will, of course, use uh, to great effect in later, uh, well, in later lectures. In either case, whether you're working with the system level representation or the, the, the state space representation, we can now formulate our optimal control problem uh, relatively succinctly, right? And I've sort of been hinting at this all along, right? Uh, we are looking here for a uh, controller, and that can be a system or a state space, uh, such that the closed H infinity norm of the closed loop system is minimized. And of course, we can use a system representation of that closed loop, or we can use the state space representation of that closed loop. Um, and of course, when we do that, right, and we formulate it in the infinity norm, that minimizes the L2 gain from disturbance to regulated output. Note also that we do have a, an additional constraint on our controller that it is in H infinity. If we're working in state space, then this is already done because all state space systems, uh, if they're stable, uh, are, uh, are in H infinity. If we're working in transfer functions, it's a little bit more complicated. We don't not going to really work with transfer functions too much in this course. Alternatively, uh, if you if you're so inclined, you can also formulate the H2 norm of the system, uh, the optimization problem. Here it gets a little bit trickier because well we still need our controller to be stable because we we don't want those internal states blowing up on us. And moreover, we would like the, uh, the closed loop system to also be stable. And remember that the H2 norm, bounded H2 norm, doesn't necessarily guarantee that the H infinity norm is bounded. And so we have to actually add a separate constraint on the uh, control problem that our closed loop system is also stable. And again, if we're working in state space, this is relatively easy. We just formulate the stability of the uh, A matrix, closed loop A matrix. If we're working with transfer functions, it's a little bit dicier. Yeah. So, right, uh, here's the, uh, the variations, right? So here's the system level representation, uh, and here is the transfer function representation, right? So, or, sorry, the state space representation of the problem, and this is the system representation. Um, in both cases, of course, if we look at this optimal control problem, right, 
Is it convex? That's the question, right? Is it solvable, right? We formulated the problem, but we haven't shown that it's actually solvable yet. Well, what are our variables? Is this a convex problem or not? Well, our variable in the system level representation is k. So how does k appear in the subjective function? Well, the h-infinity norm of a system is, uh, is going to be uh, generally convex. So it's a norm. Norms are always convex. So that's OK. But then the expression inside the norm is distinctly not convex. Why? Well, it's got an inverse term right there. Right? And so there's an invert, we're inverting our variables, and so the inverse function of any, any variable is going to be uh, horribly nonlinear. Uh, and this is true for the state space representation here, where our variables are dk, ak, bk, and ck. Uh, I think I got them all. Oh, there's one. And actually, uh, don't forget, uh, dk shows up through q as well. So it's in there as well. And if we look at these variables here, well, of course, uh, we're not even close to being linear, uh, convex or linear. Uh, so for example, uh, ck uh, multiplies bk, right? That's uh, sort of bilinear in bk and ck. And then it's also uh, has an inverse of dk here, which also shows up in q and then multiplies dk itself. And so uh, this expression, these state space, closed loop state space representation of the, um, the optimal control problem is horribly nonlinear in uh, our decision variables. Right. So we're not done yet. I guess that's the point of the problem. And in the future lectures, we'll talk about how to resolve this nonlinearity. And specifically for state space, we'll focus on how to resolve that nonlinear. I'll mention something about the system level representation in this lecture. But for the other ones, we'll have to wait, although I will mention a few options. Uh, so for example, uh, <clears throat> in state space, if we have full state feedback, right? so where our uh, we output all the all the variables, ck as identity, then uh, it's fairly easy to do the, the standard variable substitution trick and uh, linearize our, our problem. Uh, <clears throat> there's a more complicated uh, set of variable transformations, which we're going to come back to in lecture 10, uh, which allows us to solve the dynamic output feedback case. In the system level, we can also resolve this nonlinearity uh, through a uh, by parameterizing the controllers using Euler parameterization, which we're not going to discuss, uh, as well as a variable substitution trick, which I will discuss uh, in the next slide. Uh, so the variable substitution trick for uh, for systems not the same variable substitution trick as before. This is the system level variable substitution trick is to define a new variable, uh, which is this entire thing right here. And we'll call that new variable R, right? And so if we define that to be a new variable that we're searching over, clearly, once we formulate this, uh, this feedback interconnection, right, R appears linearly in the expression, and norms are convex. So this is convex in R. Now, as we talked about when we discussed optimization, uh, variable substitutions only work if A uh, you completely eliminate the previous variable, which we did. This is the previous variable, old variable. So old variable k doesn't show up here. And the, uh, the variable substitution is invertible. Now that's one's trickier, right? Uh, so given an R, can we find a k uh, such that, uh, uh, that, that, this, uh, that R equals this um, expression. 
Um, and it turns out you can, right? Uh, so, right, you, if you multiply uh, this inverse on both sides, we get I minus K P two two R equals K, right? And then we uh, multiply out P minus uh, K P two two R equals K. And then we, uh, we isolate K P equals uh, I plus P, uh, got K on the left hand side, K I plus P two two R. And then so we can solve for K as K equals P, uh, this is P two two I should say. Uh, I my plus p two two r inverse, right? So again, given an r, we can find our k, so we can invert this uh, variable substitution, but only if, right, this thing exists. And so uh, again, right, Choosing R such that this inversion exists is a whole other field of study, which we're not going to get into because it's very complicated and old fashioned and in my opinion, rather dull. Uh, if you want to think about this uh, as a block diagram, essentially what we're doing is we're taking this block and we're saying that for any P22, we can find a K so that this block is whatever we want it to be. Uh, whether that is, is true or not, has, is, 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 there, are, there are various results which allow you to get that. And there is that expression for K. And so in the system level, this problem is solvable. It is solvable. People solved it. They used to solve it this way. Uh, maybe some people still do. But I would say that's more of an 80s thing. Um, there are some unanswered questions which I haven't at, told you about, right? So how do you parameterize these variables R? How do you optimize the H infinity norm? Does this variable inverse exist? Under what circumstances? Is it a bounded linear operator? Which space does it lie in? And again, these are questions which if you really want to get into it, you can. It's not going to serve us well in this course, however, because we're, we're going for LMIs and doesn't really have an LMI interpretation. Uh, again, but it's an important body of work if you're interested. Uh, see the, just do a Wikipedia search for co-prime factorization and Euler parameterization. Euler parameterization for parameterizing the variables, co-prime factorization for making sure these variable inverses exist. We're going to ignore all this stuff. And so, uh, I, I, but I did feel it necessary for those who, uh, you know, uh, look back fondly on the 80s uh, because the people still, still worry about this stuff. Uh, in the next lecture, however, we're going to abandon it entirely and work entirely in the state space uh, representation going forward. So everything will be state space uh, from this lecture on. And so I look forward then to meeting you again in lecture nine, where we will introduce a, vi uh, a relatively simple solution to resolving this nonlinearity and non-convexity uh, through the same variable substitution trick we vi revisited in our uh, discussion of observability and controllability. So I'll see you then.